So there's a misconception that if you're single, you are incomplete, perhaps damaged, salvaged, and you won't be happy until you find your one. And that is not true. That is bullshit. It is a message that has been fed to us by media and advertising. The truth is, when you're single, you have the richest soil for growth. That's why I created this podcast. And unlike other podcasts, this one is host-driven, not guest-driven. That means I will be rotating health and wellness experts three times a week to give you the giant box of wellness crayons, not just the primary colors, so you can start building a meaningful life. It's time to give singlehood a cape. So excited to introduce today's host. Her name is Jessica Baum, and we both serve on the advisory board over at Wondermind. It's uh, Selena Gomez's mental health platform. Jessica is a psychotherapist and also author of Anxiously Attached, Becoming More Secure in Life and in Love. And she's also the founder of the Relationship Institute of Palm Beach, and they do group work, couples therapy, family counseling. Her resume just goes on and on and on. She's also um, the creator. She invented her own unique approach to healing called the self full and its method for those struggling with anxiety, relationship conflict, marital issues, and codependency in relationships. You could find her on Instagram at Jessica Baum, B-A-U-M, L-M-H-C, and at BeSelfFull.com. Enjoy. Jessica. Hi, Jessica Baum here, psychotherapist, and I'm here with Karen, a dear friend, and we're going to talk about codependency today, and we're going to unpack it. Personally, we both have personal experiences with codependency, and I'm going to talk about the science and how to heal it and what we have wrong, the messaging around it, and what you guys need to know. So I'm so excited to have this talk with Karen, who is so dear to me, and get down to the real facts that we need to know. Yeah, absolutely. Jessica, I know based on knowing you that you have a different way of looking at codependency based on the science of interpersonal neurobiology. Can you explain that? Yeah, I don't know if my way is different. I think my way is really around the science and the word codependency can carry so much shame and we can talk about what people think about it in our culture. But the truth is we are biologically wired to be in connection with others. And if you start to unpack this from the lens of interpersonal neurobiology, you will know that when we're really, really small, we start to learn ways to adapt in our world to stay in connection. And one of the ways that we adapt as babies and young toddlers and children is that we will shut down our own needs and kind of attune to the needs of others and our primary caregivers. So we kind of self-abandon as a way to stay in connection. So it's a way in which our system might, you might think of a codependent person as someone who can read the room well or has a lot of empathy or sacrifices their needs. And the truth is that the volume is up in terms of their ability to sense into the room and what other people need is higher than the volume of understanding what inherently they need and, and being able to take care of their own inherent needs. That's, that's more challenging because they've learned to stay in connection. I might have to self-sacrifice or self-abandon to make another person happy. And that's something that happens really, really early on and is much more linked to our development and our nervous system than anybody even realizes. Yeah. So you would say that I know I struggle and have been working through people pleasing. And so people pleasing is one of those codependent behaviors. Can you talk more about that and how like people pleasing falls in and kind of sneaks under codependency, I think sometimes? Sure, I think that yes is a default for many. And if there's fear around saying no, or um, someone who's not, it can go back as early as not having proper mirroring by your parents. So you don't know what your inherent needs are. So you don't know if you're tired, hungry, scared. And so you're able to just kind of go with the flow or blend in with everybody. Or it could be fear-based. If I let this person down, or if I don't take on this job, what is the fear that's driving the yes? Um, so often people who struggle with people pleasing, you know, there's fear or um, a fear of disappointing another. 
or letting another one down or letting down an important person who is a big attachment figure in your life. So when there's a lot of fear, it's hard to say no and listen to your body because your body really has um, inherent wisdom on what you need. And, and perhaps a lot of people who struggle with codependency also fit into the anxiously attached, anxious attached category. It's like listening to their body and honoring what they're, they need is very hard because they're so apt to track the needs of another and learn that I must keep another person happy in order to stay in connection. That makes sense. When I first started trying to work on this, I found that I tried to swing into like independent, like just being super independent. Why do you think so many people think that that's the solution to become very independent when you struggle with codependency? I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I have a similar story. I think when I discovered I had some codependent traits, my solution and what was out in the world and even out in our left shifted culture is become independent. It's very, very supported, become independent. And it's just, again, not how we're biologically wired. We actually need people and having needs is really important, but it's supported by our culture. And I think anytime you've been wounded and you give and you give and you give and you're exhausted, you are going to swing the pendulum thinking that's also the solution. So not only is it messaging, there's a protective part of you that might say, well, I gave so much, so I'm going to learn not to give at all, which is a very isolating place to be. And the truth is learning to have flexible boundary systems and learning to be in relationships where you give and take and that is reciprocated is actually called interdependency. And that is where the sweet spot is. So it's not about being so dependent. However, people with anxious attachment style need to depend on the right people long enough to develop a, cell, a sense of safety in their system to become more interdependent. And people who are severely independent would really um, benefit from learning how to let healthy people in and learning to depend on the right people. So it really depends on depending on the right people. And if you take this back to neuroscience, when a baby actually trusts, inherently trusts that their needs are going to get met over and over again. And that doesn't mean that a parent has to be perfect. It comes down to rupture and repair, but the, uh, the baby learns inherent trust that even if I cry and my mom skips a beat, I'm going to get my needs met. So they grow up in the world with a, a felt sense that I can trust others. Others can let me down and it's not devastating and that my needs will get met. If you don't have that inherent trust, you can swing the pendulum both ways and you can say, I, I, I need to grab onto everyone because I'm scared of being alone or I'm scared that my needs won't get met at all, which is more of an anxious attachment style. Or you can move into a more avoidant kind of um, adaptation where I don't want, trust anyone, so I'm going to become an island and meet all of my own needs. And both those are forms of like more sympathetic activation and survival um, and they don't allow for fluid relationships that allow for trust and flexibility in terms of meeting your own needs, trusting others and meeting the needs of others as well. So how do you heal from this way of relating? So if you let's start with on the avoidant, super independent side, how do you move towards building that trust and, and, and really finding that secure base um, in relationships and kind of in yourself. Yeah. So it's interesting for really avoiding people and really anxious people, the healing is the same, but it looks very different. And so really avoidant people struggle with vulnerability and their experience of letting people in when they are shut down or when they're scared is very limited because they didn't have an experience of co-regulation. So they're more likely to want to self-regulate or like shut down and less likely to reach out for support. So if you're someone who identifies as having more of an avoidant attachment style or someone who shuts down or struggles, finding one safe person where you can be vulnerable and open up to slowly and not have that person fix you or judge you because they carry a lot of shame around being vulnerable and opening up, that is over time that will become um, safer to be vulnerable. 
So that's the way an avoidant person slowly learns how to build more security. It's actually the paradox of what they want to do, but it's being vulnerable and learning to open up and to eliminate some of that shame around what, what being vulnerable means for them and opening up and allowing other people expressing their needs. A lot of avoidant people don't, they're not in touch with their needs at all. And they're scared if they have a need and they express it, it probably won't get met. And that can feel devastating at all. So learning how to express their needs to people who can kind of try to meet them is really um, helpful for anyone who's struggling with an avoidant attachment style. So what would you say for the other end with anxious attachment and like more of that codependency, like how would you then meet in the middle with that? Yeah. So I think for someone who has more of an anxious attachment style, well, developmentally, they are missing often the link of self-regulation. So they also didn't get great co-regulation. So that means mother and child, mother didn't soothe child enough. So we are not born with a parasympathetic nervous system intact. We are only born with um, sympathetic and that's still developing. So if you're a parent who might've been great, was in survival mode and, and maybe in anxiety or whatnot, the parasympathetic or the self-regulating mechanisms in your brain didn't get fully developed. So that's why anxious people can become very dependent because they don't have the ability to self-regulate. So they still need to meet with a therapist and be co-regulated when they're dysregulated. And when enough positive experiences of that, they internalize the the therapist, and they expand what we call their window of tolerance. And eventually that leads to self-regulation in um, interpersonal neurobiology. And from my line of studying, self-regulating is self-regulation is born of good co-regulation. So when we can depend on dependable people and they can show up for us over and over and over again, we learn to take them in and eventually we expand our window of tolerance. So we expand our ability to be uncomfortable. And eventually we learn self-regulating abilities from within. So it's, it's a journey and it's a process of, of bringing yourself to somebody else who's what we call an eventual state. So this is where we depend on dependable people who are safe, calm, warm, and not judgmental. And it's their nervous system that allows us to feel seen, heard, and helps us regulate our nervous system and that's where we can integrate a lot of that early trauma and those those states that can feel re- really awful and dysregulating. I love that. That's I think that's so important. And can you talk some more about what those safe, like supportive people look like? You mentioned like some characteristics of them. Does it always need to be a therapist or can it be um, like a, a friend or a relative? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, that's a good question, Karen. I think it doesn't have to be a therapist, but we live in such a left brain shifted culture, which is like a solution focused culture. And many of us, I know myself included, my parents are so well intended, but when you go to people who are more left shifted, they're looking for a solution. And when you talk about actually healing, it's about holding and being with and not fixing. So, you know, we want a fix because who wants to be uncomfortable? Who wants to be in pain? So we'll go, sometimes we'll go towards a person that will fix it or uh, a drug or, you know, anything that will medicate the dysregulation and uncomfortability. And really healing is about holding. So the amygdala is where we store a lot of the sensations and the old memories. And that's what gets challenged in the fight, flight, freeze. And it's at the holding of those experiences that like kind of cradles the amygdala. And in that holding is when we start to kind of integrate that trauma and, um, and, and we're not fixing it and we live in a fix it society. So holding the pain, unfortunately, or fortunately actually is what kind of takes the charge down and makes it more bearable so that when that keeps happening, because we all have patterns, um, that pain isn't as intense and it, it expands your ability to be with more parts of yourself. That makes so much sense. When, um, when I have researched in the past and talked through a lot of the codependency, people pleasing side, a lot comes up about boundaries. Um, 
but I know for me, that's boundaries are hard and challenging. Can you talk about why it might be hard for a codependent person um, to create boundaries or to create, you know, what they like to call a wall or a gate or something to protect themselves in certain situations? Yeah, I love that question because boundaries are thrown out all over the place. I actually just created a short course on boundaries. I think people have boundaries. What our culture talks about boundaries, they're talking about external boundaries, which is great. If you can set boundaries with your parents and your friends and your loved ones that are externalized, that's great. What people don't realize is there's an internal world that you have to understand in order to feel like you can set an external boundary. And so again, from developmental like lens, when we are not mirrored, which means when our parents can't, for some reason, see into us, see into our pain, see into our sadness, uh, like mirror our experience, we start to not understand what's going on inside. And that can be very confusing because we can get disconnected from our own voice, from our own needs. And if we weren't allowed to express our needs when we were young or weren't mirrored and didn't even, for me, I didn't even know my needs really. So, um, you know, when people talk about setting boundaries, the first step is getting in touch with your own needs and what are they really? And that's getting in touch with your body. And that's just the first layer to setting boundaries. So there's a somatic kind of approach that I take around listening to your yes, no, and maybe, and then Having people in which you can set boundaries with requires a sense of safety. So often we set boundaries with someone if they're really powerful in our life or really important to us. It can be very scary, especially for the first time or, you know, there's a lot of fear that could come up with setting a boundary. Like I might lose this connection. I might disappoint this person. And it's really the anxiety that comes up after we set the boundary that is what we're mostly avoiding. And I think if you, didn't have this mirroring and you don't have this deep connection with self, setting a boundary can be really scary because it can be confusing. Because again, if you're more anxiously attached or fit more in the codependent adaptation kind of bracket, you're more sensitive to the needs of others. So you again have to become more aware of your own needs first and set the boundary. And, and like you said, it's it's not a gate or an open field. It's kind of like this fence that you get to decide, you know, when do you open it? When do you close it? When do you let people in? When do you, when, when are you acknowledging your energetic space, your time, your time is really valuable. Where are you putting your time? What are you saying yes to? And I tell so many people when they're starting out boundary work, our knee jerk is to say yes, 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 yes. And it's like practice saying, let me get back to you. And, you know, sit with it. And and there are some tools that I provide, but start to listen to your body and then see what happens over a day or two, because your yes might turn into a maybe. The best example I could kind of give is that I remember a time in my life not that long ago where I like love signing up for courses and I'll take a lot of opportunities that come my way. And I remember telling my husband at one point, like, I want to get my doctorate. And he he was like, you are doing so much already. And I was the yes girl. I'll do this master class. I'll do this. I'll do that. And I was burnt out and I was overwhelmed. And I just um, started to slow down. And I used to say, even though this opportunity looks great, I'm going to wait and really check in with myself and see, is this something I can even add to my plate right now? And more times than not, the opportunity is great but it's not something I can give my energy to because my energy is already committed elsewhere. So it's, it can show up not just in people pleasing. It can show up in your work life. It can show up in just self-improvement and wanting to do everything and everything sounds wonderful. And then you're kind of just burnt out and depleted at the end of the day. That's why really listening to the wisdom of your body and what you really need and learning to rest and say no is really liberating and hard. It's hard and liberating for many people who are just starting to practice that. One of the things that have stuck with me the longest when it comes to this work is when you say yes to something, you're saying no to other things too, just because you only have so much Mm -hmm. time like you talked about. And so I know for me, that brings up, it's a inspiring thing, but it also makes me uncomfortable because the anxiety is real. Like when you 
or feeling like you let someone down or something like that. How do you deal with those uncomfortable feelings that come up when, when you've placed a boundary or you feel like you've let someone down or even just the fear of letting someone down? Like, how do you process that? Yeah. I mean, you honor that the fear is there and you look at what's, what's the worst case scenario and you kind of hold that. You might bring that to a friend or someone that could help you hold it. You ride it out. And if you say no to someone who's got healthy boundaries to begin with, you're not going to get a horrible reaction. If you start saying no to someone who you've never said no to in your life and you're changing the pattern, you might meet a lot of resistance, you know? And so I, I, there was an example in my book because I have a chapter on boundaries where there was one client who her, her mother would kind of dump her emotional world on her whenever. And, and the, the client was so scared to say no to her mother. And she did, she set a boundary with her mom. She said, you can't dump your world. She didn't say it like that, but she said, you know, not during my lunch break. And she started limiting it. And her mom had a really severe reaction, but she wrote out the anxiety and the attachment trauma that came up because she has a very strong attachment to her mom. And over time, her mom adjusted and they formed a new relationship, but it, it's the fear of the adjustment. And that can bring up a lot in the other person who's used to kind of any kind of old pattern of behavior with you. And so when you make changes that might fit you better, um, the other person might have, um, yeah, a reaction. I remember wanting to work with someone once and they said no to me. And I remember before I had a lot of boundaries, I was just so hurt. So you can feel really rejected too on the other end. But when you start boundary work, you start to say no more and honor, you know, where you put your energy. And you also start to accept no more because you learn the freedom of saying no and you kind of honor people's no's more. So the more you do your own work and set some boundaries, the more you're accepting of, of other people and you understand that it's fluid and flexible. And just because someone says no to you today, ironically, I'm going to ask this person to work with me again. And I have a funny feeling, I know she's going to say yes to me now. And this is years later. And it's, it's like timing and honoring your commitment and also allowing people to say no and dealing with the rejection that might come up on that end too, because Sometimes that's what's stopping you from saying no is because you don't want anyone to feel that, but no one's really rejecting you. You're kind of being redirected and, you know, people can only do what they can do. I always feel bad when people ask, can I be on your caseload? If my caseload is full, I have to say no. And it's like, I'm not being fair to that client or that potential client. If I take someone on at that time and I don't have the energy to give that person. So you just want to honor that and get really in touch with your energy system and where you're putting your, your energy and, and learning boundaries is just, it's so important. If you're boundary list, you will feel like you're running on a hamster wheel all the time because everyone has needs and the needs or running a business, they never end. So boundaries keep you peaceful. I know you mentioned it and you just mentioned it again, but like the, the hamster wheel that can become when you say yes. And when you're codependent and trying to maintain relationships. And, um, I know you mentioned it before as part of your story of, you know, you got to a place of being burnt out and overwhelmed. Um, so what would you say mm -hmm. to someone that is like currently in that place and like, how can they take steps to, to kind of back themselves out? Yeah. I mean, that's such a good question. And I was like that in my career for so long. I mean, I, I run my own business. So there was every excuse in the book, crisis management, plenty of people listening, businesses run all, um, like 24 seven. So there's always an excuse to say yes or attend to something and that will burn you out. And, um, you know, one of the things that helped me was like, if you look at the areas of your life, if you only give your energy to what your fear is, where for me, it was my business at the time, you're not going to be able to give energy to like your kids or your partner or, or playtime or your dog. And so nine times out of 10, it's fear that if I don't meet the needs of whatever is most important in my life, what will I lose? What will go wrong? It's kind of starting to look at that and challenging that 
um, I used to monitor people on Soberlink and it's a electronic monitoring device and it was 24 seven. And I always would be like, Oh, my phone's going off all the time and I have to monitor people. And it really impacted my life. And it's kind of like looking at what is coming into my world and what do I need to give up in order to to create the space for something else. And if there's a lot of fear around not attending to your business or your partner or whatever it is, it's going to be harder to create boundaries around that. Yes. I don't know. You're a, you're a mom of two. And I think for women, I can say running a business and you're an entrepreneur, having children or having something else kind of for me too, I was, I'm a stepmom, So like, learning like, well, is it fair for me to say yes in every department in my work life if I also have to give in these other areas? And it's like speaking like a good codependent. Also, you want to be able to give to yourself. Like you don't want to lose yourself. Like you have to be a mom, you have to be a business owner and you have to also be Karen, you know, and what, you Mm -hmm. know, how do you create space for all of those things? And, you know, Karen and Jessica, our names you you have to be the most important person as selfish as that sounds and when you can take care of yourself first then you can give to all those categories but often in our culture something else out of fear or drive becomes more important than slowing down and listening to your own needs mm, it's so true and it's it's so challenging i think i think of so much of it is based off of the expectations of other people. And so we feel like we have to like take on those expectations ourselves, which is incredibly challenging um, to be the perfect at all of the different, different options. Um, I think one thing that I am working on myself and I've seen as within the world of codependency, self care, and again, learning your own needs and things like that are a really big piece, but what is self care? Like, what does that actually mean to like take care of yourself and to attune to your needs and how can you kind of build a practice of that in in a week or in a day? It's like self-care, self-love is thrown out all over there. And it's just simply, it's not that simple. Um, You know, self-care is, it's beautiful when you go to the spa and you get your nails done or you go on a fishing trip, whatever that those are forms of self-care. But I think Self-care really also is allowing yourself to be in a bad mood, allowing yourself to be in sadness, allowing yourself to be more of who you are, whoever that is in the moment and giving yourself permission. I know for myself, self-care for me means some days taking it a little bit slower because I might be having a hard day or being a little bit more gentle on myself or noticing what's going on in my inner world and realizing I'm not going to be able to accomplish that much today. And so self-care sometimes is just being kinder to myself and noticing where I'm at on any given day, because that can change any day. And, you know, with self-love, kind of bothers me that everyone's like, go out and get self-love. If you don't have an experience of someone who's been loving and nurturing, and many of us do, um, I know my grandmother was one and my mom and, and we have, we have experiences, but the ego state or the nurturing self-love that most people are looking for is developed by the felt experience of having that on the outside. So you can't just wake up and know how to love yourself. If you can't resource experiences of people who have been loving, knowing what they would say to you in those moments, knowing how it felt to be in their presence. That's how you start to cultivate like an inner, we call it an inner nurturing community, but starting to cultivate some self-love and self-care is around the the essence and the people of people who have actually you've experienced that with. And, you know, we go back to neural development. If you had parents that were really anxious or unavailable or weren't particularly nurturing, it is very hard to have self love or know how to have healthy self care. Cause we end up giving, trying to receive it from someone else um, often because we're not inherently taught or we haven't absorbed that, experience enough to give it to ourselves, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, absolutely. I know you've touched on it a little bit here and there, and I know that, and just with working with you and, you know, just knowing you and talking with you, I've seen how much the inner child experience or talking to little me is such a valuable part because when you have those experiences in your childhood um, and those unmet needs, and then you become an adult, I think sometimes it's forgotten that um, those those people are still connected. And so what is the inner child work? What is little me work? And how does that, um, what does that help or how does that help with codependency? Yeah. And so that's a, that's a good question. I think this is also in my book, chapter two, but the exchange of the little me pact, this shows up in our relationships and we're not even conscious that we do it. So we'll get into a relationship and we'll hand our wounded part, which is usually feeling healed in the beginning of a relationship over to our partner. And so we're handing our power away essentially. So if you have a not special little me or an abandoned little me or an invisible little me. And so that's a, that's an, a wound that you carry and that somebody else feels you makes you feel special or makes you feel seen that part of you like wants more of that from them. And there's an exchange. I'll make you feel seen. You make me feel special. And there's nothing wrong with that, but that part of you is really calling for internal healing because if your partner is not aware and you're not aware, you can get stuck in, in a trauma bond or a codependency dance where you'll be very disappointed when that partner lets you down for whatever reason. And so I see that happen all, all, all the time. And knowing that your core wound, if you heal it from the outside, you're giving that external thing power and also healing it through a therapist is being with that little me and re-experiencing some of those early experiences in the presence of someone who's nurturing and safe so that you can integrate and learn how to take care of that part of you and that you don't expect another person to take care of that part of you. And I know I'm guilty of that. I can't think of one person in my practice or a human being who hasn't had that experience. I think that's the nature of kind of falling in love is that, you know, you really think that your partner is going to take care of all your needs and that's just not humanly possible. At some point we all fall short here and there. So learning where your wounds are and what is the job of the relationship is to become aware and supportive, but it's not your partner's job to heal that part of you. And that's where a lot of the confusion takes place. That makes sense. And I know you mentioned it earlier, um, but like rupture and repair. And I would imagine this is a big part of that rupture and repair is when you realize this is a need I have and it's unmet, or this is an experience I had a long time ago and now it's coming up again, it's being activated. So can you talk a little bit about like rupture and repair and what it means in a relationship? Sure, I mean, so rupture and repair is what happens between a baby and their mother when the baby is crying out and maybe even fearful that their needs aren't gonna get met and uncomfortable and then the needs do get met. So there's rupture repair and, and a good, and this is not about being a perfect parent, 70% of the time, if rupture and repair is being met, you form a more secure attachment. In a relationship, especially for people with anxious attachment or someone who feels a little bit more on the codependent, rupture feels extremely scary because we're biologically wired for connection. And for these individuals, rupture feels like a breakup or the fear of abandonment comes to the surface. So conflict is often avoided and or just really dis dysregulates. But when we can come back and really have empathy for both people and we can repair the rupture most of the time, often um, in a healthy dynamic and often with anxious attachment and people with codependency, they will avoid rupture like so badly that they, that's where the self-sacrificing comes in because ruptures are just so scary and rupture and repair and conflict are so normal in developmental processes in and in our adult relationships because we're always like we're adapting as children and our nervous system is programmed as a child and then we bring that adaptation into our deepest bonds and we our strategies and adaptations 
end up getting replayed in our adult relationships. So all of your behaviors make sense. Um, for anyone who's listening, who has more of codependent or anxious attachment, rupture is harder to navigate, but absolutely necessary. And if you can, you know, we talked about not having self-regulating abilities in your brain. So of course, rupture can feel really destabilizing for anyone who can't self-soothe on their own. So that's why there's a lot of avoidance that happens there and a lot of fear that if there's conflict or a rupture that you're, you're basically feel in your body, like your life might be over. Yes, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, I think we covered the gamut. Um, anybody who's listening, I, I did write a book anxiously attached, becoming more secure in life and love. And I unpack a lot of this. Um, and releasing a course on boundaries, a really affordable course. And I do a live course in January. I forgot the start date, but it's only for 10 people. And it's a live course that really unpacks codependency. And it's a process group online on Zoom. So those are my offerings right now. And I'm excited to be helping people really kind of navigate this and feel more free in their life and be more flexible in their relationships and hopefully get more of their needs met and a a better understanding of what's really going on in their body and in their nervous system and how to just how to heal that and, you know, transform their life. I love that. Thank you for talking with us. So about thank that. you so much for this chat, Karen. Yes. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I don't think so. All right. We're all good. We'll end the recording and I hope whoever is listening got what they needed to hear. I hope that episode was helpful. Hey, listen, if you want to share your singlehood journey, if you've gone somewhere, come back. If you have revelations and wisdom, please share your story. It's going to help other people. Nothing makes us feel more connected than hearing other people's stories. So just send me the audio of your story and you could just record it directly from your phone and email it to theangrytherapist at gmail.com. Also, if you want our Single on Purpose newsletter, go to singleonpurpose.life. That's singleonpurpose.life. You will get tools and articles and other people's stories and also uh, Zoom links to private gathers. So if you want to join our community, go to singleonpurpose.life. Thank you for listening. Be well. We hope you tell a friend. Hey, before you go, I want to invite you to the Single on Purpose private community online. It's off of social media, no ads, no algorithms. We got forums, we got live groups, we got webinars, and we have social hangs. We also have offline in-person hangs happening soon. So check us out. Go to singleonpurpose.life. That's singleonpurpose.life, and I will see you inside.